Amen. Amen. You guys can be seated. Well, good morning. Man, I'm so glad that you're here. If you've got a Bible, I invite you to turn to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. And, uh, man, it's exciting days around here, and I can't believe we're into March already, but here we are, and Easter is coming. And, uh, church, I just want to remind you, man, we're, we're not just trying to, uh, to fill up a room on an Easter Sunday. Man, we believe that every time you and I take a chance and invite somebody to come with us, whether it's Easter, maybe it was today, maybe it's next week, man, we believe that God draws people to himself, and one of the things he uses is the preaching of the gospel, and so, man, we want to do that, and so we want you to be able to trust us, that if you invite somebody, man, we want to share clearly how they can know Christ, and not just make a decision, but, man, make a decision that will forever alter and change their lives. Now, the same way that you and I know, man, what we celebrate on Easter is a significant historical event don't lose that it's not just on the church calendar and it's a historical event there was a man named jesus who lived in nazareth who walked the earth and was crucified and rose from the dead three days later our faith is not a wish faith our faith is founded in human history where god invaded in the flesh and so man we never forget that and uh, that, you're going to hear a lot of that as we get ready towards Easter, get closer, and even today we'll talk some about that. But let me start with this question. How many of you have ever had to set the table at your house? Maybe you were a kid, maybe you were a grown, a grown adult, maybe your wife told you to, maybe your mom told you to, but here's one thing for me. I, when I was a kid, there were a couple of times that we had to kind of go and to set the table. We didn't always eat at the table. That wasn't something we always did. Sometimes you ate in the living room. Sometimes you ate out in the yard, depending on the, the that wasn't common. That was like when there was barbecues and stuff, right? Some of y'all are like, preacher, y'all ate out in the yard? No, no, we had a table, but when there were things outside, you ate outside. But I mean, I can remember when mama would say, hey, we got to set the table. There were two things I knew to be true. One, we were fixing to eat good. You don't set the table for peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. You don't set the table for grilled bologna. Now, some of y'all might. We didn't. If we were setting the table, something significant was about to happen. The second thing that was true was if we went through the effort of setting the table, it wasn't just going to be the four of us were in the house that I grew up. Somebody else was coming. Somebody else was coming over, and it was fixing to be a throwdown, a shindig, whatever you want to call it. We set the table with intentionality and with purpose. And so, man, we had to go through all the motions, and I didn't always do it right. Mama had to come behind me and correct me, but, you know, you had to get the napkins just right on the right side. And where they go, some of you are like, no, it's on the left. I don't remember. I remember putting the napkins on the table. But the other thing I know is you didn't go to the table, and you didn't just throw the forks or the spoons in the middle of the table, right? Now the silverware has got to be placed just right. On a napkin, it's got to look right. Depending on your level of etiquette, you might have had one fork or seven forks. I don't know what to do with more than one fork, so we just had one fork, a spoon, and a knife, typically. Silverware was right. The plate would have to be right. And then the, the glass for the drinks, the sweet tea, or whatever it was we were going to have with the meal. And then the table had to be cleaned off. You couldn't have extra books. You couldn't have the mail on the table. The table was set for what was about to take place. There was some effort and some intentionality. The, the table, setting of the table was a way of kind of communicating this expectation, this anticipation of what was about to come. Now, probably you're thinking, preacher, I've never thought about that when I set the table. Well, I want to help you today kind of get there because what we want to do today is we're going to jump into a, a part of the story of Jesus where he is at the table with some of his closest friends. The men that we know as the disciples, Jesus gathered them together. They're in an upper room and he's been sharing a meal with them. And, and in a literal sense, the table has already been set, it's been prepared. They're observing the Passover meal. And so there's some traditions, some rules they've had to follow and things they've done together there in that moment. But now as the meal is kind of coming to a close, Jesus is going to kind of metaphorically or figuratively, he's going to set the table for them for the things that are coming now. For the things that are about to take place. In fact, the, the kind of the context of this, we're not going to go back and pick up all of this, but really chapter 13 begins this story and carries it through chapter 17. But it's this moment with Jesus in the upper room with his disciples. And he's beginning to talk to them about what's going to unfold over the next few days. Now, he's told them before that what they think is going to happen and kind of who they expect him to be as the king and the Messiah is not the way it's going to go. Throughout Jesus' time with his disciples, he's told them, guys, I have come to die. 
and I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be handed over to the, the leaders. They're going to take my life, and in three days, I'm going to rise from the dead. So it's not new information that he's giving them, but it is now moments away, not weeks away. What's about to unfold is not off in the future. What's about to unfold is only a few hours away. And so Jesus, at this table with his disciples, begins to once again kind of talk to them about what is coming, about how he's going to, in a few moments, be arrested. And then he's going to be punished and ultimately crucified. And the disciples hear him once again talking about this. They're still struggling to understand, hey, what is all of this and why is he talking like this? And their feelings are all over the place. And then at one point, you can go back and read this in chapter 13, Jesus tells them, hey guys, one of you, right, there's 12 people around the table plus Jesus, one of you is about to betray me. One of you is about to betray me. And he doesn't mean like tell one of my secrets, like you're fixing to stab me in the back. You're fixing to hand me over. And you know what the disciples start doing? This is interesting, and probably a whole other sermon could be had off of this. You know what they start doing? They don't start pointing the finger. Like Peter doesn't say, it's Judas. Andrew's not like, it's probably Peter. He always talking. They don't start pointing the, the finger. You know what they start doing? Everyone around the table starts saying, Lord, is it me? Is it me? There's something in their hearts that as he's talking about this story, there's something in them that's like, something's off. Lord, could it be me? And then you have Peter. Peter listens to all of this, and down around verse 36 of chapter 13, he says to the Lord, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus begins to tell him, hey, I'm going somewhere. You can't come with me. And Peter, being Peter, says, Lord, wherever you're going, I'm going. And whatever people try to do to you, I'm going to protect you. Jesus, I've got your back. If all these other guys, this is interesting, Peter in this room of this, the guys that he would call friends is like, all of these guys are weak, Lord, but I got you. I got you. All these other guys may leave you, but Lord, I'm with you. I'll, I'll die for you. I'll fight for you. Remember what Jesus tells him? says, Peter, you're going to deny even knowing me before the rooster crows. And their feelings are all over the place. They're trying to understand what's happening. There's so much in their hearts and their minds that's happening around this table. And Jesus began the night by washing their feet. And he's observed the, the Passover. And now he's talking about betrayal. And now Peter's saying these things. And the Lord's telling him, hey, you're going to deny me. And Jesus continues to talk to them about what is coming and what it matters and, and who he is and what he's about. But I think it's important to understand that around this table that Jesus knew everything that his disciples would do and how they felt. Like he understood. He understood what Peter was wrestling with. He understood what those other disciples were wrestling with as he talked about these things. He knew that in the next few days that they would all scatter all of them even john who records for us john will get close enough but john never speaks up on behalf of jesus he kind of watches and even at the cross john will be present but there's no there's no help and jesus knows all of their failures and all of their moments and instead of scolding them and telling them hey you guys should do better you need to be more ready for this Jesus begins to talk to them about what's going to take place in the next few days and how it will forever alter and change their lives because they belong to him. And so I want to kind of pick up into that story this morning. And, and really, I'll just tell you today, I'm trying to set the table for what we're doing the next few weeks and, and kind of give you a, kind of some background and picture of what's coming. But I want to use these verses in John 15 because I think it's what Jesus is doing. He's doing some things for his disciples, knowing that they're going to fail, knowing that they're struggling, knowing that they don't understand yet. He's setting the table for them to have hope in a way that they haven't fully grasped just yet. So look with me at John chapter 15. Let's read verses 1 down through verse 8. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you 
unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. If you're taking notes this morning, I want you to write this down. Number one, Jesus gives them three things to begin to shape the conversation. Number one, he tells them about an established relationship. Jesus uses this image of the vine and the vine dresser and the branches, which probably if you've been around church, it's familiar to us, but it's not familiar to us in the sense in which it was the first century. These disciples knew what, was a, what a vineyard looked like. They knew what it took to care for the fruit of the vine and to make sure that it produced. They knew what would happen if a vineyard didn't produce. And so this is a very familiar picture for them. And Jesus is using it to show them that this vine, it's the part of the plant where the life of the plant lives. It's what flows out to the branches and causes the branches to produce the fruit that could be used. And so Jesus says to them, you guys need to understand that in a relationship with me and for who, whatever it is that you need in life, I am, and this is the word he uses, the true vine. He doesn't just say, I'm the vine. If you go back to chapter 14, he has talked about being the way, the truth, and the life. Here, he doesn't say, I'm the vine. He says, I am the true vine, which implies what? That there are other vines in the world. There are other ways that people try to get life and to produce fruit, and there are other things that men and women will be tempted to, to latch their lives onto for life. And Jesus says all of those other vines can't produce in you what you most need. I am the true vine, and my Father, my heavenly Father, he is the vine dresser. His goal for the men and women who would come to know Christ and follow Jesus, the Father's goal is for us to be connected and healthy and to thrive in the life that he's come to give us. And so the Father takes care of the vine and takes care of the branches and prunes them and cleans them to make sure they're producing. And then there's this warning that we'll talk about in a moment about branches that don't produce fruit. But Jesus tells his disciples in verse 3, he says, already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. That word clean there, it's the same root word that is translated prune earlier. Jesus is telling them, hey, one of the ways that I have prepared you for what's coming, one of the ways that I prepared you as my disciple is, man, I have been teaching and showing you the picture of what's coming. But most of all, I've called you to myself. And the relationship that I've established with you is not a life-taking relationship, it's a life-giving one. These disciples have come to Jesus. You go back and look at their stories. They come to Jesus from places where they had just been living. They'd been just trying to figure life out. Most of them in the family trade, and then it means they had failed at some other things. And so they're just in the family trade and trying to do the best they can to make ends meet and to provide for their family and to provide for their future. And, man, they have done all of these things just trying to make life as good as what they thought it could be. And all of them would say, man, there was something inside of me that was lacking. There was something inside of me. There was a hunger. There was an, a dissatisfaction that I could not satisfy no matter how good I was at my work. And it was to those men that Jesus had come and he called them by name. He had called them to himself. They've walked with him for three years. They've seen things that no fisherman tax collector would have ever dreamed of seeing. They sat with Jesus as he would feed 5,000 with just some fish and a few loaves. They've seen the dead raised back to life. They've seen the sick healed. They've gotten to go and to do some of those things. Sometimes we forget that about the disciples, don't we? It wasn't just that they saw some things. Man, they experienced some things. Jesus sent them out on mission trips where they healed and preached the gospel and set people free and provided for people. Man, they've been a part of some incredible, incredible things. But the relationship that Jesus had established with them was not just what they would do. Everything that Jesus had taught them, everything that he had shown them, everything that they had been a part of was not for, so they could say, hey, look how good we are. It was all part of the process of Jesus transforming and changing them into the men that he had called them and designed them to be. They 
were called to something greater. And what they were going to need was not their own efforts and not their own drive. They were going to need the vine that would give them life. But don't miss this. The relationship that Jesus called them to in every single instance, he initiated it. He called them. He sought them out. His father had sent him to the earth to call men and women to himself to be rescued from sin. And really, when you think about the disciples and their role within the story of Jesus, that they're really like ground zero of the mission of Jesus. Who were some of the first people to believe in Christ and to become his followers? Well, it's these men. They're the ones that are spending time with him. They're the ones who have seen all these things. They're the ones who will be given the mission now of taking it to the earth. But I want you to notice that in every case also that Jesus never scoops them up and carries them away from the hard things. I mean, even here, they're at this table. Judas has already left. We know that he's gone to draw the Sanhedrin and the council to come and to arrest Jesus in Gethsemane. All of this is beginning to unfold. And Jesus knows in a few moments these men are going to walk out of this room and their lives too will be in danger. And do you notice that he doesn't tell them, hey, go hide? Hey, guys, I've prepared a, a safe tunnel for you guys to get out of the city and to go and to hide and to wait for everything else to play out. He never gives them those instructions. He never tells them, hey, get away from me. In fact, you're going to see in the Garden of Gethsemane, he takes those disciples with him. They're with him when he's arrested, and then they will flee and leave him. But Jesus doesn't tell them to run. Because even in the difficulties, he was transforming them into people who would one day live out the life he was showing them. But it was an established relationship. That's what Jesus is telling them at the table. Guys, you're mine. I'm the true vine. The Father is the vine dresser. I've spoken a word to you that's cleaning you up and pruning you and shaping you into who I need you to be and who I've designed you to be. Not just who I think you should be, but who I've created you to be. And that relationship is what I've done. And I'm not backing off of it, which takes me into the second thing. It's not just an established relationship. The second thing he reminds them is that there is an ongoing commitment. You look at verse 4, it begins with just the phrase, abide in me. Jesus is giving them instructions. He's giving them a command. That, that word abide, if you've been around church, you probably have heard somebody say it means to remain or to, to make your home in. Jesus tells these guys, remain in me hold on to me he's calling them to to hold on to what it can't be physically holding on to jesus in a moment he's going to be snatched from them there's nothing they'll be able to do to stop that story in a moment he's going to be taken from them so he's not talking about a physical holding on to he's talking about holding on to who he is holding on to what he's taught them holding on to what he's about to do and what he will do He's given them instructions about what life is going to look like when he's gone from them. And these men have listened to that story and said, Lord, I don't understand. How can your leaving us be a good thing? Lord, every time we've tried to do something, you've had to come back and clean it up. Lord, every time we've tried to, to run ahead of you, God, we've messed it up and you've had to instruct us. God, you've told stories. Jesus, you've told stories that, that we didn't even understand the point. You had to pull us aside and, like, break it down for us. Jesus, if you're not here, what are we going to do? And Jesus knows that they're feeling all of these things. He knows that their inclination is going to be to be their own vine. Hey, I'll, I'll, Jesus, if you're gone, then we'll be our own vine. We'll be the vine. And we'll have life, and we'll be able to do some things. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. I'm not asking you to go and to do your own thing. Look at what he says. Abide in me, and I in you. There's a significant thought here that we can't just rush past or miss. Jesus is telling his disciples, I'm not asking you to be committed to me, and then maybe I'll be committed to you. Jesus is telling his disciples, guys, I'm in. I'm in. I've called you to follow me, and I am fully committed to you. I've called you to follow me, and I'm asking you to abide in me. But your abiding is also going to realize, part of that is going to be realizing that I'm abiding in you. I'm giving of myself fully and freely to you. He's telling his disciples, look, I'm not backing away. Now catch this. The disciples don't understand what's coming next. 
they don't realize that Judas is fixing to betray. They don't realize that Peter is going to deny. They don't realize that all of them are going to be scattered in a moment. But Jesus does. Jesus knows full well what each of those men will do in the moments ahead. And he says to them, abide in me and I in you. Guys, whatever you've got going on inside your heart, whatever it is that you're about to do, it's not causing me to take a step back. That's what Jesus told them. I'm not backing off from you. I'm committed. I'm so committed. I'm going to give my life for you. Jesus is telling them, guys, I'm holding you. I'm giving you life. So what is this abiding? What is it that we are to do? And I would just tell you, Jesus is telling those guys, hey, just come back. Just come back. Our role in abiding is not to figure it out. Our role in abiding is positioning ourselves so that life can flow through us again. It's dealing with some stuff that Jesus has already made a way for. It's learning to walk in the life that he is giving us. I mean, think about the commitment that Jesus shows. How do we know that Jesus is committed to those who are his? Well, we know it by all the events that we've talked about so far, the events of Easter. The life that he lived, the death that he died, and the fact that his tomb is empty and he's promised to return. He is fully committed to every man, woman, boy, and girl who would say yes to him. Fully committed. Well, what if I don't get it right? Well, what if I mess up? He's fully committed. The blood that he shed at at the cross of Calvary is enough to save you initially and enough to carry you through to completion. It's everything for us. So when we as a church say, hey, Easter's a big deal, you need to understand that's not just because it's on the calendar. It's like, hey, that's the day people might show up for church. There might be a few more of us. Easter's a big deal for us because it is, as Paul said, we are celebrating the foundation of everything. If he doesn't live, then we're fools. And Jesus tells them, no, no, I'm I'm abiding in you. You're going to be tempted to go and to do other things. But remember, look at verse 5. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus is telling them, guys, if you switch this, if you think that you're the vine and I'm one of your branches, you're not going to do anything. Hey, I wonder if not for some of us, if maybe that's not where we are spiritually. It's that we think that we're the vine and Jesus is just like an injection we can take sometimes that makes us go a little faster. Almost like Jesus is our Mountain Dew. <laughs> right? Some of y'all are like, ah. Uh. Yeah, it's almost as if, Lord, I'm trying hard. I'm trying to do the things you, told, you said. I'm trying to be a good person. I'm trying. And, Lord, if you just come alongside of me and give me a little injection, that'll help. No, he's not trying to give you some Mountain Dew. He's trying to be your life force. He's the vine. We are the branches. And he tells them, guys, you can't do any of these things if you're disconnected from me. A healthy branch bears fruit. And our commitment to Jesus is not earning us a better position. It's allowing us to experience the life that he promised. And here's the third thing. The third thing Jesus says is it's a process to remember. Jesus does give a warning in verse 6, that, and really up in verse 2. Verse 2 and verse 6 kind of go together. There's this warning that there are some who will say, I have life in Jesus, that I'm a part of the vine that is Jesus, and they really have no life in them. And if there is no life, there is no Jesus. And so he gives this warning of, hey, there are people who will look like they've got it all together. There is a faith that is a false faith that says, hey, I belong to Christ, but I have no life. And if there is no life, there is no fruit. And without life and fruit, there is no salvation. He gives this warning all night. He said, well, preacher, what does all that mean? It means that you and I had better be sure we're connected to the vine. That, that, that's what it means. We can dive into the Greek and we can dive into the Aramaic and say, hey, what a, let's parse these words out. Sometimes we get hung up on the wrong parts of Scripture. What Jesus is telling them is there's no life apart from me. And if you chase life apart from me, you will not find it. So come to me. Abide in me and I will abide in you. And now in verse 7, look at what he says. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you. Jesus is telling them, hey, hold on. Hold on to me. 
who's also told them, guys, I'm holding on to you, and your grip on me is not your own effort. It's not some things you've got to go figure out on your own. Your abiding is directly linked to your trust in me. And here's, here's another thing. Man, and I'm wrestling with this in my own life, so I want to just tell you this and, and know that I am a work in process with you. The, the word trust in the scriptures, or even the word hear, they always imply and require obedience. There is no trust without obedience. There is no hearing the word without obedience. It's just words and sounds rushing past us. Those things are linked in Scripture. And so when Jesus says, if you abide in me, look at what he says, and my words abide in you. He's not talking about trivia knowledge, right? He's not asking us to play quiz bowl. He says, if my words abide in you, remain in you, the implication is, as my words and my commands are in you, you obey them. You learn to trust me. And our obedience, here's the thing about obedience. Church, we've got to understand this. Our obedience is not sucking life out of us. It's putting life into us. Every command God has ever given his people, Old Testament all the way into the New, every command was not to take life from people, it was to give life to people. He was speaking ways to keep them free. Even take the Ten Commandments. If you just take the second half, where he begins to talk about not killing and not stealing and not bearing false witness and those things, those were things that would keep people free. Every one of them. And every law since then, Jesus was telling the disciples, look, my word in you is life to you. It's why the psalmist said, your word is better than life to me. It's a light unto my path. Your word is giving me freedom. But it's not just knowing it. It's not just information. It's a word that remains. It's talking about obedience and trust. Obedience is not something Jesus asked us as our task master. Obedience is what happens when we want life, and it's what he uses to shape us. The commands he gave to his disciples for that three years they were with him. They were not things to take life from them. They were things to give them life now. And I'll make you a promise based on what Jesus told his disciples time and time again that his words, his commands always bring life. Every single time. As you and I trust him and walk in obedience, living out what he's commanded, we begin to produce the fright that brings life to our own world and to others. You see, abiding here for Jesus is wrapped up in everything. It's the one thing that allows his life into every area of our lives. If you've got some areas today, if you're a follower of Jesus, and you've got some areas where it just feels like there's no life, hey, let me just ask you a very pointed question. Are you obeying what he's told you? Are you obeying what he's told you? Well, Ben, look, the word doesn't say anything about my situation. Have you looked? Have you listened? Have you asked him? Because his words bring life, and that word is meant to obey, and that's where the doors of life begin to open. In fact, he tells them, look, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Now, some of us would like to just take that verse out, right? Ooh, Lord, ask whatever I wish, and it'll be done. Lord, I wish I was 6'5 and about 185 with a 4140, right? Let it be. It's too late for me. That's not what he was saying. You, you can't disconnect, ask whatever you wish from if you abide in me and my words abide in you. Jesus is telling them, hey, in relationship with me, what you're going to learn is to ask for the right things. Some of our most frustrating things in life when it comes to our relationship with God is we're asking for the wrong things because we're not abiding and we're not letting his words abide in us. And so Jesus tells them, look, there's a process to this, to remembering as you are shaped, as you are following me. And I'm going to change you. And I'm going to take care of you. In fact, he tells them in verse 8, this is how my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, that you have the life that I promised. And it begins to bear fruit in your life, and so you prove to be my disciples. Your life and my life, as we learn to abide in Christ, it's meant to show people that he is all that he's promised. It's meant to show people that everything that he has promised, he has done. As they're sitting at this table, wrapping up this meal, again, the disciples don't know what's coming next. 
but Jesus took the moment to say, hey, this won't be the last time we eat together. And at this table, you're fixing to walk out, you're going to fail, and you're going to fall. But I'll meet you on the other side. He's setting them up for something, the hope they didn't even know they needed. He's setting them up for something they didn't even really understand. But in about four days, he'd be risen from the dead. And he's going to meet them on a shore, and he's going to fix a meal for them on a beach. And he's going to show them that the hope they thought was just a dream was reality. Man, Easter is so much more for us than just a holiday. It means that no matter where you are today, that Jesus has not backed off, but he's still saying to you, hey, come with me. I'm for you. I'm committed to you. Maybe you're here this morning and you're like, man, I don't know about all that. Like, I've, I've kind of know about Jesus. I'm aware of who he is, but man, I don't know how what he did and that story has any effect on my life. Man, my hope for you is like it was for those disciples. That maybe you walked in this morning just trying to figure things out. And you would hear clearly today that Jesus is the true vine. There is no life outside of him. You can plug into everything you want to. And at the end of the day, the only place you'll ever find life is from the one who created it. And he came for you. So, man, if you're here this morning and that's your story, that, man, you didn't know that, or maybe you've never put your trust, your faith in that, man, that's a step of obedience. Just saying, Lord, I believe. Beginning there. And if that's you this morning, we'd love to talk with you before you leave. But I would also say to those of us who are followers of Christ, how do we know that these disciples abided in Christ? How, how do we know that they bear a lot of fruit? Here's some really good news. And I've said this to you before, but I mean it with all that I am. The way that we know that these men did this, that Jesus was a true vine and they bared much fruit, is because you and I are here today. If these men don't bear fruit, the story of Jesus might just stay in Jerusalem. But they were connected to the true vine. And we are the legacy of the gospel. So my question for us is, who's going to be our legacy of the gospel? Who will sit one day worshiping King Jesus because you and I learned to abide in him as we experienced him abiding in us? And we bore fruit so that somebody else could know him. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for a chance to teach from your word. God, I never want to take these moments lightly. God, I don't want to treat it like another lecture in college or a seminary class. But Father, I believe what I said, that your word is life to us. And God, when we learn to abide in you and your words abide in us and we walk in obedience and trust, God, you are so good to give us the life that you promised. Jesus, you said you came to give us life and life more abundant. I don't want to settle for anything less. I'm thankful for moments like this, Jesus, where we get to catch a glimpse of your relationship with your disciples. God, knowing their failures, Jesus, knowing their failures, knowing what was coming, you loved them. You prepared them. And you met them even in their failures to bring them back to yourself that they could become what you'd called them to be, designed them to be. May we know that to be true for ourselves. That wasn't a one-time deal in history, but you've done that for every man, woman, boy, and girl you've ever called to yourself. You keep coming after us because you want us to know life. You want us to walk with you. You want us to live in freedom. So Lord, would you help us to see that there's more hope than we realized? that what we may feel today, what we carry today is not the end of the story. I'm so grateful that a moment ago we sang those words, I know how the story ends. Jesus, we will be with you again. You're my Savior, my defense. So there's no fear in life or in death. God, thank you for your goodness to us. In Jesus' name, amen.